Good morning. It is good to be together in God's house, fellowship to worship, and I trust that uh, God will have a word for us this morning, uh, a word of encouragement, maybe a challenge. Maybe it's a legend by now. Uh, I don't know. I heard this story way back when I was a little guy. I think my dad liked to tell the story. It's a story you've probably heard about this man years ago who, who took this journey across the ocean on an ocean liner ship, and, and it was going to take a couple of weeks. And uh, so in preparation, he packed a bag of biscuits and some cheese, and so day after day, he would take his bag of biscuits and go on the deck and munch on his biscuits, and they got drier and drier as the trip went along. A couple of days left on his trip, a man comes to him on the deck and says, Listen, sir, I see that every day you're sitting here on the deck and eating your biscuits. Um, why aren't you joining us in the dining hall? In the dining hall? I can't do that. That'd be much too expensive. Well, sir, didn't you know that when you purchased your ticket, the meals were included? Three meals a day? Many of us who work for employers have a benefits plan. It's a plan of health and some medical support and things like that. It's above your wages, above your salary. It's a benefits plan. Many of us have that. It covers a certain portion of some dental care, maybe some eye care, some medications, maybe chiropractor if it's a good plan, maybe a massage, maybe travel insurance. Often there's limits on these things. A few weeks ago, I had to go to a uh, dental specialist in Winnipeg. Uh, they were suspecting I needed a root canal. And before I went, I looked in my benefits plan book. If this was going to happen, what would it cost me? How much would my benefits plan cover for this root canal? Fortunately, I didn't need it. That was a good day. Is it possible that at times we need to check up a bit on what's in our spiritual benefits plan? What's in our blessing plan for us as followers of Christ? I wonder how often we don't, in a spiritual sense, eat dried biscuits and dried cheese and maybe even lament about it when we should be dining on the finer things that our spiritual benefit plan has to offer. The psalmist says, in a Psalm 103, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. And then he goes through a list of benefits. Second Peter 1, Peter says, His divine power has granted to us everything we need for life and godliness. I think it's appropriate, and especially in a morning like this when we are preparing for communion, that we remind ourselves of what we have been given, the benefit plan, the blessing plan that is ours through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul is writing, and he is giving us, and he is presenting to us, I believe, the, the foundational, the summary uh, a kind of a summary document of what is ours, the benefit plan, the blessing plan that, has, that is ours. Ephesians chapter 1, and I'll read it in a few minutes. Verse 3, he starts out this way. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Paul, in this verse and the following, presents to us, uh, it's almost as if it's a song of glorious praise and worship as he begins to clarify for us and explain to us the incredible realities that are ours in Christ. Uh, commentators, they say that verse 3 to 14 is actually, in the original language, is one long sentence and it's Paul writing not so much a well-thought-through theological thesis, 
But it's rather this song of praise that bubbles out of him. And he, he goes on and on speaking of one gift and blessing after another, one wonder after another. Where, where he, he just, it's hard for him to stop. And so this sentence of his keeps getting longer and longer and longer. He goes on and on. Reminds me a bit of one of uh, my son Chris's baseball coaches many years ago. I think he was playing bantam ball. And, and after one game, one of the coaches gathered the players around. And, and the coach was going on and on and on, talking about things the game. Finally, one of the players, in exasperation, says, Coach, coach, take a breath. Just, just stop, take a breath. Put a period somewhere. One commentator suggests that verse 3 to 14 is a bit like a snowball that begins to tumble down the mountainside, picking up volume, picking up speed, and turning out into a full-blown avalanche. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. Who is the initiator of these blessings? Well, he said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who are the recipients? We are. Who has blessed us? His creation These benefits, these are ours for the taking, ours for the experiencing. How are they given? They are given in Christ. Through Jesus Christ. It is only through the finished and complete work and ministry of Jesus that these blessings are available. He is the means. Jesus is the means whereby these are available for us. And as we read these verses, I would suggest you take note of how often in this passage Jesus Christ is referred to in some way or another. Maybe the word in Christ or in him or he speaking about Jesus Christ. One commentator says there's about 26 times in these 12 verses that Jesus Christ is referred to. And where are these realities? He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. Meaning they're not visible with our physical eyes. They're not the blessings of a good meal, of a, 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 a good job, or a, uh, a good family. Those are blessings, of course. But those are not the blessings he is talking about. He's talking about blessings in the heavenly realms. It's a spiritual reality that is out there. And in this spiritual reality, God in Christ, or God through Christ, has has established things and and made things available for us. We also note, and as we read these verses, I want you to note of kind of the the sense of or the purpose or the, the attitude with which or the delight with which God through Christ is sharing these blessings with us. Over and over again, you will hear words like in love or in accordance with his pleasure, to the praise of his glory, freely given, riches of grace lavished on us, his good pleasure, praise of his glory, praise of his glory. It's not a reluctant benefits plan. It's not a reticent one. It's not a skimpy one. Our, our, our medical plans, they have limits on them. For example, my dental plan, I noticed, had a, had a cap on it. So and so much a year for major work. But this isn't the way this spiritual plan goes. It's extravagant. It is lavish. It is abundant. There is delight in the giver. There is an overflowing, all to demonstrate the incredible grace and mercy and love of our Heavenly Father as it was demonstrated through Christ. What's in this package? We have been given every spiritual blessing. We have full access to them as followers of Christ. That does not mean that we understand them or experience experience them in, in, in the full measure. No, not at all. That does not mean that that there isn't opportunity for growth or maturing into these blessings. Follow as we read. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. 
In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ." In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. What's in this benefit plan? I have picked out five, and I'm just going to skim through them quickly. I won't be very theological this morning. I want to simply remind us as we prepare for communion of the incredible wealth, spiritual wealth that God has prepared for us. First of all, verse 4 and verse 11, Paul says, we have been chosen. Verse 4, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Verse 11, in him you were chosen. Before the very creation of the world, from eternity, God had a purpose and a plan for humanity. All were to be all were to be created for fellowship and relationship with God. And the very pinnacle of creation, humanity, created in the very image of God, was to live in this unbroken harmony and union with the Creator. We know the story. That plan was marred. Sin broke that relationship. But God's glorious plan didn't stop. Through His initiative, through His provision, God steps in and again makes everything possible for humanity to be reconciled with the Creator. God's choice over and over again is for humanity to have a relationship, to save them, to redeem them, to rescue them. This being chosen, I believe, is, is, is a, mis, a mysterious kind of, uh, of union between or with the free will of man, and we can't go into depth here this morning. Scripture presents both amazing truths, the free will of man coexisting with the sovereignty and choice of God. Salvation, reconciliation, redemption are for everyone. All those reconciled and saved are the chosen elect. If you've chosen Jesus then you're part of God's eternal chosen redeemed. If we ever feel as if we're a complete loss, beyond hope, beyond the thought of God, be even tempted to conclude that somehow we just can't be part of that chosen elect, I would suggest rebuke those thoughts and replace them with the truth that God aggressively desires and longs for each one to be included in the chosen. Let's go on. Secondly, we've been adopted. Verse 5, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus. Some of you here this morning understand the picture of adoption well. You understand it much better than I do. Either you were adopted or you did the adopting. In a spiritual sense, it's very simple. We were orphans with no family ties, no hope for life, no hope for the future. We were rejected. We were homeless. We were without spiritual parents. But God, in his great grace and mercy, chose to create a family his family, to make his followers his children. 
And now, as adopted children of the Heavenly Father, and I love what Paul does in Romans 8, he talks about how now we can cry out in our hearts, Abba, Father. We as children cry out to our Heavenly, our spiritual Father. All ties to the old are broken. Paul talks in Colossians 1 of how God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His Son. A transferring from from the old hopeless family into the new family of God. We've received a new name. We were children of this world, but now we are His children. Paul talks at one place about receiving the full rights as His sons. We've received a new legal standing. Satan no longer has has authority or, or control or hold on us because we, through the finished work of Jesus Christ, have this new legal standing as children of the Heavenly Father. We've received a new image. Scripture talks about how it's God's desire that as we transfer from that old into His family, we receive His nature. We take on His image. We take on, on, and we're transformed into the image of His family and bear His image. Do you ever feel as if you don't belong? You feel alone? Remember, as a follower of Jesus, you've been adopted into the family of God. You are His beloved child. He knows you by name, and you are His. Verse 7, third one. We've been redeemed. In Him we have redemption through His blood. This is imagery that kind of finds its, or, or we understand its fullest meaning impact when we understand it in the culture and practice of slavery. Slaves are powerless. No rights, no privileges, no freedoms, completely and hopelessly held captive at the complete mercy of their earthly master. And redemption occurs when along comes a new master or a new owner and pays the price and redeems that slave from its hopeless situation and sets that slave free. A couple of years ago, there was a movie uh, made of this man, uh, African-American named Solomon Northup. I think the movie was called 12 Years a Slave. He was a free African-American living in the northern U.S., I think in the state of New York. He was a farmer. He owned land. He was a musician, and then he was invited to go and play music. Uh, was it in Washington? I'm not sure. But there he was kidnapped by slave traders. And he was taken deep down into the south, into Louisiana. And there for 12 years he endured the horrible, horrible cruelty of, of his slave life. He tried to escape and was recaptured and sold to another sl- slave owner. Finally, after 12 years of that miserable existence, word gets back to New York somehow. And one day, a a horse and and carriage arrive on that plantation where Solomon is a slave. And these guys step off the carriage and walk up to this black man and say, Are you Solomon? Yes. They show him documentation, and he is free to get into the carriage and ride away with them. The master, the slave owner, is furious and angry but can do nothing as Solomon has his redemption and is taken back way up to northern New York where he is reunited with his family. Each of us, as children of Adam and Eve, carry a load and nature of sin from which we cannot free ourselves. We are powerless to liberate ourselves. Sin, the old nature, has its control over us. Yet along comes a new master, a new Lord. He sees value and beauty and dignity in his creation. And so he pays the ransom price. And as slaves, we are redeemed, we're emancipated. And Paul mentions the, the, the freedom price. It is his blood. 
Peter talks about that in 1 Peter 1. For you know it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Redemption. Do you ever feel in bondage? In bondage to anger, to bitterness, to envy, to lust, to greed, and try as you might, you cannot free yourself. Let us remind ourselves of this part of our benefit plan of redemption. Through the enduring and precious blood of Christ, we have been redeemed and set free. We no longer need to feel compelled to sin. We are free. Our new master has paid the price. Fourthly, we understand a mystery. Verse 9, he has made known to us the mystery of his will. This winter, uh, when Pauline and myself were on vacation, I was reading a Christian novel, and uh, I was just completely captivated and engrossed with this book, a book written by Ted Decker uh, entitled A.D. 30. A.D. 30. And it was a, a novel centered in the life of Christ. In fact, I enjoyed it so much that I read it for the second time on our holiday, and the second time I read it out loud to Pauline, the whole book. But I remember the first time as I was reading it, I got to the end, and the end came rather suddenly, and in exasperation, I kind of said, come on, you can't quit here. You can't end the story here. And then I saw the next page coming soon, A.D. 33. Okay, so it's his marketing tool that he wants to make sure I buy his next book, which I probably will. It's frustrating being held in the dark, isn't it? In suspense, we so much want to know the end of the story. Paul is not talking about a mystery here in a sense that it's hard or difficult to understand. But rather he's talking, I think, in the sense of it's a, he has made known to us a mystery because it for so long was held a secret or was unknown or not understandable. And I think certainly part of that mystery, Paul goes on to talk about in Ephesians 2 and 3, where, where he reveals the mystery of, of how Gentiles are now finally uh, heirs together with Israel, uh, together in one body, shares of the promise of Christ. But I believe there's more to this mystery, and Paul explains it in verse, in, in, I think it's in verse 10. He's made to known to us the mystery to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. God has revealed to us the last chapter or conclusion of the eternal story, a story that will someday be wrapped up. Paul discusses in Romans chapter 8 of how creation is groaning as in the pain of childbirth, is waiting to be redeemed. He says in Romans 8, 21, creation, creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We see now a world that is in turmoil and trouble. There is conflict, there's war, there's hate, there's strife, there's death, there's killing, there's disaster, there's tragedy, there's confusion. Creation is in trouble, humanity is in trouble. And without knowing and understanding the mystery of God or the purpose of God's plan, we would have no hope. We would be in dread and fear and doom and gloom. We'd go, where is this all going? But knowing what God's plan is, we have hope. We have anticipation. And God's eternal plan someday is to step in to this painful and hurting and broken world and to reconcile all things to himself. Does this world discourage you? Do you ever wonder why things are happening for how much longer they can happen and why God doesn't intervene? Remember, we know the end of the story. No, we don't know all the details and, and can't be certain of exactly how it will all unfold, but we know the end of the story. We know enough. 
We know what the ending will be, and we as his children, there's this spiritual blessing and benefit that we can have a peace and a calm and a rest knowing that we will win. It's this song on CHVN, and uh, Pauline plays it at home sometimes. There's coming a day when the sun will always shine. He's going to wipe away every tear from our eye. Hold on, my brother. Things are going to get better. We're going to smile again because we win in the end. Quickly, lastly, number five. Another benefit is this, that we have received an inheritance. Verse 14, And having believed, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Imagine this with me. A family, a mom and dad, sitting down together maybe with, with someone who is good at this, and writing up a legal will of how the assets of their estate will be passed on to the children. And within that will, mom and dad, they put in some clauses, and it is this, that if the parents both pass away before the children are 18 or 21 or maybe 25, the inheritance is to be kept in trust. This means that the inheritance is kept safe, it is guaranteed, it will be given to the children, but in the meantime, guardians are assigned or executors or trustees who have been appointed to take care of the children. These guardians have access to some of that estate to take care of the children, to feed them and clothe them and to provide a good education. That to me is a picture of what has happened in the spiritual realm. As God's children, adopted children, having received full rights as his children, being privileged to be part of his family, we also have been promised an inheritance, an eternal inheritance, a place and part in God's eternal heavenly home. First Peter says, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. And as a guarantee and as a, or a down payment, God has given part of himself, part of the triune God, the Holy Spirit, has been given to every child of God. He's not left us alone. God has come to make his dwelling and abode in us through his spirit. And this is that down payment or that installment, that guarantee that someday the complete and full eternal inheritance will be revealed. What's in your spiritual benefits plan? Do we experience this in its fullest measure? No, I'm sure I don't. But I simply wanted to share with us this morning this, this beautiful passage, this rich, rich passage that invites us to consider of what God through Christ, our Heavenly Father through Christ, has accomplished in, in this spiritual heavenly realm. And we as his followers, through the ministry and work and life and death and resurrection of Christ, we have access to. It is ours. Let's be challenged and, and provoked. Let's be uh, uh, invited, even as we share in the communion, to consider and to thank our Heavenly Father of what He has accomplished for us. Amen.